You are going to relax. So begin by making yourself perfectly comfortable. Sit in your favorite chair. Listen to the sound of my voice. Open your mind and say the words, Hey, all you zombies! <laughs> Hello and welcome. My name is Chris Abel. Welcome to the show. And as always, I'm with my partner, my post-apocalyptic partner in crime, Mr. Richard Krauss. Okay. Uh, that was, a, that was a, a fitting tribute. That was a fitting tribute. Uh, let's see if I can... Uh, a fitting tribute to this man. Yes. The amazing impossibleist ravine who passed away this week at age 77 we'll talk about him uh, shortly but um, you know I grew up with that kind of uh, going to see shows by ravine that were exactly that was pretty bang on that was pretty great stuff thanks yeah well I mean um, I of course did not grow up with ravine but I mean this is what I like about Hail you zombies I've been hoping for this kind of stuff to happen you mentioned him a few mm -hmm. episodes ago. Uh, and so in that time, I've had a chance to, to kind of look him up, to discover a lot about him. But, uh, yeah, he, he hit the news yesterday. My Twitter feed went crazy. It is amazing how many people in Canada know who this man is. And I've discovered that it is a pastime here in Canada that as the man known as Ravine would travel across Canada, he would leave behind him waves of Canadians who then walk around talking like that for about yeah. the next week, right? They'd walk into, you know, restaurants and say, I'll have a cheeseburger with a plate of fries. Just well, amazing. It, or singing the song, The Man They Called Ravine, which was, uh, uh, you know, it really, we played that on the radio this morning. Uh, Ravine uh, died yesterday, along with Annette Funicello, although, you know, not together, but they passed away on the same day as Margaret Thatcher. So, of course, who gets all the news? Not Margaret Thatcher, you know, or, or not uh, Ravine or Annette Funicello. Margaret Thatcher uh, took all the headlines uh, away from uh, two other people that I would have liked to have seen get written about a little more. But Ravine... Uh, spent a great deal of time, he was from Australia, and he was a hypnotist, he spent a great deal of time uh, in Nova Scotia when I was growing up. Now he did tour across the country, but I think audiences uh, in the 70s starved for entertainment as we were uh, in the small towns down along there, would flock to see him, and, and you know, he would play in high school auditoriums. I remember seeing him in a place called the Bridgewater Memorial Arena, uh, so you know, the local hockey rink, which wasn't you know, a, a big city hockey, probably seated, you know, 1,500 people, something like that. But, you know, Ravine, for some of these places, some of these, you know, places that he was playing, there weren't 1,500 people in town, you know, so they would come from all around uh, to come see him. And when I was a kid, I went up on stage uh, to be hypnotized because I thought, how cool would that be? And uh, he, he tried to hypnotize me, and it didn't work. He would start the show by bringing you know, eight or ten people up, and some would go under, some wouldn't. So I got sent down, back down to the audience. But uh, the shows were hilarious, because what he would do is you know, hypnotize you and then make you act like a chicken. Or, you know, the idea would be, you know, he would hypnotize each person, and he would say, okay, when you hear this catchphrase, you know, uh, when, you, when I say the word baloney, you're going to walk around and cluck like a chicken. And when you uh, hear the word nine, you will then uh, act like jump up and down as though you're on a pogo stick. And then, of course, he would bring them all out of their trances and they would all go, oh, man, I, what, I, I feel great. I feel awesome. And he would say, do you feel like a bologna sandwich? And then they'd you know, start jumping around the stage and acting like a chicken. And that's what the show was. As in, in my memory, there may well have been more to it than that. I think there's very likely a kind of uh, uh, self-help uh, phase to it as well, where he would hypnotize you to help you stop smoking and that kind of thing. But, you know, the reason that you went to see it was to see your friends and family jumping around like a chicken on stage. And he toured for years and years and years. I mean, he had a career uh, down there uh, that spanned a very long time. And uh, I was uh, really taken with Ravine and, you know, the ads uh, on television. But um, in particular, I, I loved because it seems so big, kind of Las Vegasy to me. And look at him. Look at the hair and the goatee and everything. I mean, if there, if you have an image of what a magician or a hypnotist in 1975 would look like, <laughs> say it right there. And uh, you know, there's I, I found this online too, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, Ravine 
So a drawing of the Ravine uh, uh, Marquis, which is pretty great, in his car with the R on it. Whether it's real, whether he had that or not, I don't know. I imagine so. You know, a, a good way to drum up publicity in these small towns would be to, you know, roll into town in a Rolls Royce with a big R on the side. You know. Well, and, and this is the thing that I've, I've sort of learned in terms of trying to check him out is that, um, uh, you know, you you hear that his act was about hypnotism and turning people into chickens, and I think most people go, oh, you know, it's it's such a tired thing. There have been so many people who do it so poorly, and it's just one of those art forms like ventriloquism that just ended up getting a bad, bad rap. My understanding is that there was a period of time in which magic wasn't doing as well, and so magicians used to sell books that would say how to do their, their tricks, and people would buy them. And then the worst thing that came out of that was that you, you released an entire army of pathetic amateurs that would go out and just sort of ruin the whole scene. Uh, so just as ventriloquism, if you can find a master ventriloquist, it is just amazing. Ravine is, is apparently a master hypnotist, although he didn't always use the word hypnosis apparently. No, no, he didn't. In fact, for a long time, he wouldn't call himself uh, a hypnotist, but that's exactly what he did. But, you know, he, he took himself uh, seriously as one would, I guess, you know, dealing with this. He wrote books about the subconscious and, and you know, uh, had the, the self-help records. You could buy the, the, the Ravine records uh, <laughs> that always had very dramatic album covers. Like, and they would help you sleep or, you know, help you quit smoking or whatever. And, uh, and you know, here's a guy who forged a career in Canadian showbiz uh, for many, many years. He also, uh, and I didn't know this until after he died, um, uh, after he retired from the stage, he uh, managed people. And he was the manager of Lance Burton, who was one of the big shot uh, Las Vegas strip magicians as well. So he, he was involved in that as well. And here you go. I was just uh, popping this up for you. This was tweeted by Lance Burton. Today, uh, and it's a photo of him uh, with Ravine. And he's wearing a Ravine t-shirt. And look at that short man. Look at that hair. And that, that is awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is really, really good. Um, so, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's funny because yesterday my Twitter feed just went crazy with Ravine. And initially I thought it was you. I thought you were retweeting stuff about Ravine, so I was really shocked and surprised that it wasn't. It was everybody in this country. Uh, and when you sent me links, and the, the one link had the, the demo of his record that he used to sell, you know, right. uh, you were going to relax. I know that because it was featured on an album by Shadowy Men on a Shadowy Planet. Right, right, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, and, and so it's, it's amazing because all these Canadian people were coming out and talking about it. Uh, the Trailer Park Boys were tweeting about it. Uh, half of CTV was going crazy about Ravine. And people were, you know, just the, 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 the warmth, the, the memory, the celebration that people wanted to have for this fellow. It was, it was really astonishing. Well, I think if you are of a certain vintage, like I am, uh, growing up in the 70s, uh, you know, he was one of those acts that would uh, that would come to your small town. I mean, you know, Ravine, uh, most people uh, wouldn't come and play at the Bridgewater Memorial Arena. You know, if you were lucky, maybe the Stampeders would come ripping through, or a band like Streetheart, you know, might come and, and play. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of uh, the, the entertainment that you got was country and western performers that mostly weren't making records anymore or, you know, weren't making hit records anymore. And, you know, for me growing up, I had zero interest in that. Uh, so there wasn't a lot for me there. Uh, but the rock bands, yeah, absolutely. And Ravine, and he was around. And Ravine was, you know, a showman. I mean, you just you saw the photos. I mean, the hair and the whole thing. And that way of speaking that he would use. And, and, uh, and the shows were... The shows were exciting, as in my memory. Now, I have a feeling that probably by today's standards, they would be very bare bones. But there's a, for me, there's a, 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 a certain kind of a warm spot that I have for, for Ravine and, and his ilk, these guys that came here and you know, made a living entertaining com uh, Canadians uh, at a time when, you know, by, by touring the country front to back and you know, back to front, um, uh, you know, there, there weren't that many of them, but those who, who did never became huge stars, I guess, but, um, you know, certainly uh, made an impression. Well, you know, um, what you want to do is you want to search YouTube for Ravine. Um, yeah. Because, I, you know, when you first mentioned him, and I did a search at that time, there wasn't a lot to find 
online about him. Uh, he has his own website, ravine.com, which I believe is run by his, his daughter-in-law, somebody close to him. Do a search today, and that's all changed. Uh, and this is what really surprised me, because I really did think, as you said, he's of a certain vintage. So I don't expect him to really connect with a, with people who've grown up as an internet generation. Right. Um, normally, when we're talking about something like this, our video is probably one of the only few that's out there. If you do a search for Ontario Specialty Company, right. Hey, Zombies is the top hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today, this video that you and I are recording is probably the 15th to have hit YouTube. Right. Uh, while I was doing a search and I noticed that there were videos that were hitting like every three hours, every four hours, every six hours, and people are grabbing every copy of anything they can get of Ravine and they're posting it on YouTube. So there's a lot of footage of concerts he's done in this town. And the other cool thing is as you, you, you see the various newscasts that are being done across the country about Ravine, each one claims that Ravine held their community in his special uh, heart. So it's hilarious. It's like, you know, um, Ravine, you know, he wasn't that celebrated around the world, but here in Edmonton, he was, you know, considered one, and you see here in Nova Scotia, here in Ontario, and it's just fantastic to see that he had that effect as he went across the country. Well, it's interesting because uh, at the radio station this morning, now there are a bunch of younger people working at the radio station who may have missed the Ravine uh, tours of, of long ago. But I also think that if you grew up in Toronto, you might not be as aware of him, only because I doubt that he really played here very often. No. He probably played in Peterborough and in you know, places like that around Toronto uh, often. And uh, the host of the, of the morning show that I was on this morning, John Moore, uh, is from Quebec, and he said, oh my God, Ravine. And he knew the song and the whole thing, because I, I've always really, and I, will, I stand by this, I, I consider him a, an Eastern phenomenon. I, I consider him sort of Quebec and East. The guy was a superstar uh, there because he uh, he just spent so much time there. So Edmonton can claim him, but we all know really the truth. Oh, it's it, yeah. I mean, you can have a real cross country battle about that topic. And there's a, a video online that talks about all his connections to Edmonton. I'm sure they 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 would. There might be fisticuffs. There might be. You know, <laughs> Queen's very rules being being brought into play, but yeah, just an amazing kind of man to kind of find and discover. There are videos online that show him doing really lavish. Lance Burton on Twitter said that his shows were very lavish right. in terms of the stage magic. And one of the clips that I saw, a very shaky, blurry cam kind of thing, showed him dressed in Oriental attire, performing Mandarin uh, sets with beautiful, you know, women being cut in half and all right. the, the hoop. Through the lady, beautiful kind of stuff. Oh wow, that's a great. That's film. another picture of him with Lance Burton. So yeah, that's that's not my memory of those shows at all. I, I don't think that I ever saw him uh, do magic. Uh, I think I uh, uh, my anyway in my memory anyway. I don't. I only remember the hypnotism and uh, and how kind of great those shows were. But uh, um, man, I have to. Have, I'm itching to get on YouTube now and have a look at some ravine. <laughs> Well, and I, I know last time you mentioned him, I had told you to, to check out a fellow by the name of Darren Brown. That's right. Who's kind of the more modern uh, equivalent. Uh, in terms of, of taking, if Ravine took hypnosis and said, I want to get away from that whole phase in the 1950s and 60s where people were using it to visit past lives and instead try to turn it into an awareness of what's happening in your mind, Darren Brown has kind of taken that forward and said, I, I want this to be as psychological as possible. He calls right. himself a, a psychological illusionist. Right. But what was interesting, uh, a comment that he made in an interview was he said that when he was young, as a magician, doing kind of stagecraft. He said the, the allure at that time was to show, look at what I can do. Aren't I amazing? Right. And he said as he matured as a performer, uh, hypnosis well, or, or suggestion, let's put it that way, tricks of suggestion of the conscious and the mind ended up being um, more valuable to him because he says what happens is you end up taking the audience and putting them in center stage, giving them the spotlight. Right. So it's no longer about you. You end up sort of maturing. And I I get the feeling that Ravine had kind of learned that same process as well because right. that seems to be why people love him is that he made the audience to be the spotlight of his shows. Right. Well, uh, here, this is the poster right here that I remember. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, from it, it's a fantastic. I wish I could find a bigger one of it, but that that is a fantastic poster. I remember that one uh, very much and also... 
this one as well. These are the ravine posters of my youth. These are the posters. These are cool. Like the thing that I loved about them and still love about them today uh, is this one. I mean, it's, it's so stylish with the big V and the man they call ravine. It's so dramatic. But uh, they look like old fashioned. Like that could be uh, Blackstone or something. You know, like they look like old fashioned magicians things. So he very definitely had you know uh, that connection to the old school magician. That very grand kind of mysterious thing going on that that uh, appealed to me then and still does. Yeah, no, just brilliant. So, I mean, this week is going to be interesting. If you're a Ravine fan, look and search on social media. There's lots of people talking about it. I can believe the number of people. And just the the, you know, the, the immediacy of people wanting to, to use social media to express and say, I know this guy. I re oh, yes, Ravine, he's fantastic. And it's not nostalgia. I mean, there, there's it's almost like um, they're remembering the, the joy that he gave. And that, that's a fantastic thing to, to have as a legacy for him. Yeah, yeah, I know, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's funny because I, you know, we did the podcast a couple months ago maybe or something where we talked about him a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I, I was wondering, you know, what he was up to, what was going on. And it's, you know, it is sad news, but he was 77 years old. It seemed like he, he did everything he wanted to do. So hopefully the man they call Ravine is, uh, uh, went peacefully and happily. Yeah, it seems to be. I, uh, there's a, a video that seems to suggest he did a performance here in Canada in, last year. Oh, yeah? That's really true. Uh, he was voted um, Magician of the Year uh, in 2009 by the... Oh, no. Yeah, like there's, uh, you know, he, it never... Uh, let me just look, go back here. I think Lance Burton said that uh, in terms of a stage hypnotist, his word, there is no peer. That yeah. He was really the best, the highest of that particular form of craft. Wow, well, there's uh, in 2009, I haven't seen this. I wonder if it'll land on YouTube. Um, in 2009, Canada's CBC television broadcast a biography titled The Man They Call Ravine, spotlighting his career in magic mentalism and hypnotism throughout his 55 plus years as a performer. So I, I, I wonder if that'll turn up somewhere. CBC will hopefully re air or it'll turn up on YouTube or something because I would love to see that. Yeah, yeah, no, it looks really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, no, that's cool. Uh, one woman on Twitter said she thought this was awesome that uh, Ravine was sort of reappearing in the world at the same time that Trance was hitting movie theaters, you know. Uh, yeah, well, I wrote that. I wrote that on, on, uh, on Facebook. I thought, could it be, you know, could it be uh, uh, a coincidence? I don't think so. No. <laughs> that's funny. Well, he, uh, he uh, was certainly a big part of my childhood. So, uh, you know, uh, too bad to uh, uh, have to uh, talk about him in this context, but I'm glad people are talking about him. And I'm really thrilled that uh, on YouTube there is uh, uh, a lot of ravine out there because I will be spending some time with that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today was uh, Jurassic Park. Right. You just saw Jurassic Park 3D. You reviewed it. You gave it, what, four stars, I believe. I did. It's very good. I, you forget after 20 years. Uh, you know, I, I probably hadn't seen it in the theater for 20 years. And then, you know, if I have seen it, it's been on DVD or Blu-ray. And it's very possible that I fast-forwarded through a lot of that first hour to get through the exposition, to get to the dinosaurs. But you forget when you sit on the big screen, this is how it's meant to be seen on the big screen surrounded by it. The 3D, whatever, it doesn't matter, it really matter so much, doesn't add that much. But uh, when you do see it from start to finish, uh, the, it, it's such a beautifully put together movie, it's crafted so well. Uh, Steven Spielberg has impeccable timing, and you really get a great sense of that in the film. Well, I, I, I've seen Jurassic Park 1, I think I've seen, I remember Jurassic Park 2, I don't know if I've seen Jurassic Park 3, but they are working towards a Jurassic Park 4, which will probably get a lot of attention. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of people really angry, even though, you know, there isn't a lot of details about the movie out yet. People are pretty ticked off. Now, I was upset. And I've, I've since found out people are not upset for the same reason I'm upset. See, I'm upset because there isn't going to be an able source in Jurassic Park 4. Uh, and yes. Clearly, there should be an Ablesaurus in Jurassic Park 4. I mean, it's the fourth movie. They're, they've gone through all the major dinosaurs. We need new ones. And, and you know, they're being... I mean, it's not just that it's an Ablesaurus, but it's a pretty cool dinosaur. Um, but anyways, no, the reason that paleontologists are pissed 
and I really mean pissed. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you <laughs> some of the comments here that came up. Uh, do -do 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 -do. I'm pissed off by disregard for knowledge, said uh, Darren Nash of the University of Southampton, UK. It says, it helps perpetuate the notion that dinosaurs were all scaly dragons, alien and unlike modern animals. And what he's referring to here is that the director, Colin Trevorrow, tweeted that there won't be any feathers on his dinosaurs in Jurassic Park 4. Uh, and this has really upset a lot of paleontologists because, of course, since Jurassic Park came out, we have learned a great deal more about dinosaurs. Right. And the old model of seeing them as being lizards has disappeared. There's now overwhelming evidence that show that most of the Jurassic Park, Jurassic era uh, dinosaurs had some form of feathering on right. their bodies. Well, they, they talk about that in the movie a little bit. Not so much feathers, but Sam Neill's character, the paleontologist, is convinced that dinosaur is, you know, sort of developed into birds and that sort of thing. And he sees, uh, they find at the beginning of the movie, they find some bones. And he says, look at the, uh, the, the, the uh, thighs on this, on this dinosaur. They're quite clearly inverted like a bird's. And they go on like that for a little bit. So there, there is talk of that in the movie. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of scientists are upset. Because when Jurassic Park came out, that was a controversial theory. Uh, right. Sandy's character is based on a paleontologist named uh, Jack Warner, uh, who has been, you know, um, sort of championing that theory. But since then, there have now been overwhelming evidence. They've found uh, keratin within fossils that suggest, you know, the, the material in, in feathers. There have been these little orbital sockets that show that clearly there were wings. In a lot of these dinosaurs, they've actually found wishbones. So it's right. made very clear that most of the dinosaurs are out there. We've been thinking of them as being like lizards. Right. We're wrong. They're, they're more like really kind of strange birds. Hmm. And so the issue now is that with Jurassic Park 4 is the chance, the opportunity to kind of uh, show the latest scientific information. Right. And, you know, this is something that's always been an issue with Steven Spielberg's movies, thanks to Jaws. Uh, he's had to, you know, there's been so much work to try to undo the problems of Jaws in terms of what it did for sharks. They don't want the same thing that kind of happened for dinosaurs. They, you know, these are people that work in museums. The last thing they want is every week to have to tell schools of kids, uh, dinosaurs have feathers on them, and each one go, but in Jurassic Park 4, you know, it's like yeah. that kind of thing. So I kind of kind of understand sort of the, the, the frustration and the issue. Um, one scientist here says, the decision jars with overwhelming evidence that some Jurassic Park dinosaur stars were feathered and misses a terrific chance to affirm modern concepts of dinosaur paleobiology with a wide audience. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the team behind uh, Jurassic Park 4 have been pretty much saying, nope, no feathers. Mm, well, you know, I, I, I'm of two minds of this. I mean... I think that if they are doing that, there is perhaps a dramatic reason why they're not doing it. Maybe, you know, the dinosaurs didn't look as cool. Maybe they thought that people would be like, what the hell are the feathers on the dinosaurs for with the, the you know. I mean, there, there could be any number of reasons. But clearly, like, decisions like that in movies, big movies, $200 million movies like this, don't get made lightly. They don't go, oh, yeah, we're just not going to use feathers. We're not, uh, feathers are crazy. We would use feathers. That's crazy. Uh, they they spend some thought put towards it. Now it doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean that the the right kind of thought's going to. Do it, but but it does mean that some has gone into. So I mean I would I would clearly guess that maybe it doesn't fit the storyline that they want to present or something like that. And while yeah maybe I feel a little sorry for the people in museums that have to answer questions about Jurassic Park. You know maybe they need to print up a little uh, a little brochure that they hand out to people that says Jurassic Park is a movie and not real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, so uh, here I'll help you. Uh, I'll educate you a little bit okay. on this. Do -do -do -do. Let's find my uh, images. I had to close down all these windows. The Great Ravine is all over the screen. Oh, okay, there we go. All my preview win open windows opened. Uh, and what I'm looking for, doo -doo -doo -doo, here we are. So this is what a velociraptor should look like um, based on the latest oh. evidence. And you can see it's a dramatic change. Yeah, so it kind of looks like a turkey with a long neck, like a, a different shaped head and a long tail. Well, and, and the, the Velociraptor at the time that Jurassic Park was made was about the size of a turkey, and, and to embellish it, they turned it into large child-eating monsters instead. 
But uh, you, you can see that this is a creature that looks far more bird-like than it does lizard. I could kind of understand why the, the movie producers might be hesitant to kind of go in that direction. You're, you're trying to sell a movie that's based on scary monsters, and it's hard to make this creature kind of look scary. Well, the, the, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they probably want some sort of tie-in with the, with the original movie as well. If you're using a, a velociraptor, it kind of sort of kind of has to fit the lore of the movie that came before it. So the other side of this argument is here. So this is from the television series Doctor Who. Right. And Doctor Who recently had an episode where they had dinosaurs on a spaceship. That was the big tagline. Doctor Who went crazy. He's like, look at this. There's dinosaurs on a spaceship. I can't believe this. Um, but th what they did, and it's hard to kind of see in this image, was they added a little bit of feathering on some of their dinosaurs. Uh, and you can see that it, you know, technically they're, they're appeasing their scientific, you know, researchers that work on the show. But on the same hand, it doesn't take away from the, the scariness of the actual dinosaurs. They still look like they can eat you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, also we're, we're dealing in a dramatic form here as well. And, and we're so used to the idea formerly, well, to our imagination of what dinosaurs look like, that, you know, that's what people think of when they see dinosaurs. Yeah, it's the usual problem of dealing with expectations. Yeah. Every movie, everything that's ever created that tries to tell a story has to deal with that. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, I mean, they still have dinosaur experts that are consulting in the movie. Jack, uh, Jack Horner is still involved. Right. Uh, they were saying in the, the original movie, what they wanted with the velociraptors was they wanted them to walk around with their tongues darting out, doing that. Right. And all the, the paleontologists, I guess their blood just drained right out of the face. Uh, no, 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 no. And so the compromise, and I think it turns out to be for the better, is that you see that scene where the velociraptors look through the window yeah, and the yeah, door, yeah. and they go, and their, their breath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. yeah. And so that was a compromise in terms of how to give them something creepy to do. And so sometimes these debates can actually, I think, come up with something that's a little more effective. Well, we'll have to see. There is... A solution, of course, right. because of all the dinosaurs that are out there. There see, happens to be people see problems. You see solutions. I do. Well, as it turns out, not all dinosaurs have shown to have feathers. In okay. fact, there's one group that doesn't have feathers. And I, I, I put forth for you the able sorts. Uh, um, in yeah. fact, there already are toys for the able sorts, as you can see here. Uh, I know the Ablesaurus has small little tiny arms in front, but that's what the embellishment is for. You can still make them very, very... Oh, very as good as a T-Rex, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He also yeah. has the little arms. He's got a little bit of strawberry jam on his muzzle there, but you know what? You can you can change that. That's all good for the movie, but I mean, they're very large. Um, and if you want to know how just scary they are, actually, I actually splurged and got the replica fossil of the Ablesaurus head. Look at those teeth. Those yeah. would be very scary, especially in 3D. Yeah. I think yeah. a 3D able source, and you can have that that fantastic line of "Run for your lives!" It's the able source. That, that would be great. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> well, um, it, but isn't it true? And I don't want to burst it. That it was actually called like the able source. Uh, yeah, the, the the there's able source is one of a group called the abelosaurids. Ah, uh, okay. And and the, like this, but particular guy is actually called uh, a Carnotosaurus, and right. he's part of a group. Uh, so there actually is about seven dinosaurs. It's like, um, you know, Fox Force 7 kind of group. They, they travel the world, solve crime, and that kind of stuff. There's Each one has its own name. There's Carnotosaurus and the others. But yeah, I mean, you know, only one needs to really be in the movie. I, think I, I didn't want to be that guy that had to bring it up. I just uh, thought, yeah. you know, just before we get a letter about it. Yeah. Well, I would, you know, I, I would probably create my own subtitles when it comes out on DVD. So every time it's like, oh, no, they, they got it wrong. It's Ablesaurus. You know, there you go. Well, um, this week, you know, normally at this point, we've talked about The Walking Dead for some time in the show. Yeah. Uh, there's no Walking Dead to talk about now. It's off until October. And I did the, the next best thing. Uh, is earlier, uh, well, I was late last week, uh, I spoke with uh, Glenn Mazzara. And Glenn Mazzara is uh, the, uh, let me just show, I'll pull this up. Glenn Mazzara is the uh, showrunner and writer and executive producer uh, of The Walking Dead, and he's, he's left the series now. Uh, he's just signed a deal with Fox and will be uh, continuing his uh, 
uh, you know, creating television for the Fox Network. But uh, right now, he's uh, still the guy responsible for what I think is the best season of The Walking Dead. And he came into the radio station uh, last week, and we uh, sat down and talked for about half an hour. Uh, the audio of that is available on all manner of uh, of uh, forms. Uh, it's on my YouTube site, the Mix and Cloud uh, uh, version. You've you've put up. Up. It's on the Hey All You Zombies site, so you can you can listen to this, and it's worth a listen. I found him fascinating. He he uh, he was a hotel or a hospital administrator, and you know he'd always wanted to be a writer. And in fact, he didn't have a laptop, uh, so he would actually write on the hotel on the hotel on the hospital computers at work. So when he was supposed to be, I guess you know, ordering new drugs for people. Uh, he was, you know, coming up with ideas for shows. And he would send uh, scripts around and pitch things around. And finally, there were enough bites that he uh, uprooted his family and moved to Los Angeles and became uh, a producer and uh, writer for the show Nash Bridges. And then from there, many other shows leading up to The Walking Dead. But really interesting guy. Loads of interesting things to say about... Uh, the process of writing for television and uh, that kind of thing. And I asked him, I had to ask him about Daryl, probably, you know, the breakout character of this season on The Walking Dead. And he said, well, you know, when I first took over the show, he said, I kind of wrote Daryl out for a couple of episodes. And then I found that I really missed him. I missed what he brought to the show. And so he brought him back in. And, of course, you know, the rest is history. Now we have, you know, a, a new great character who I think, uh, will continue to evolve and change and become something else. Now, you know, Glenn Mazzara wasn't able to tell me what it is because he's no longer going to be in charge of that, but I do think that Daryl is going to continue to change into a, a, a compelling and interesting character, but I think he's going to be different than he is right now, uh, soon after the death of his, of his brother. Um, but it was a really fascinating thing. And, of course, you know, around the radio station when we had him in, people were going ballistic. I walked him into the studio, and someone just yelled down the hall, I love The Walking Dead! As he came in. And, you know, I wasn't sure if The Walking Dead might be a little sore spot for him, given that, uh, yeah. you know, what, what ended up happening. Uh, but it doesn't appear to be. I mean, I think, and rightly so, he's proud of his work on the show, uh, you know, interested to see what happens next season, and uh, and uh, he was uh, lovely to talk to. That was that was one of the, uh, the, the cooler interviews that I've done uh, recently. Well, I think he might have, it might have been a sore spot if you were pushing for what-if scenarios, like yeah. what's going to happen, you know, that kind of thing. I think that would have probably ended it right then and there. But I found him to be very... Uh, erudite and intelligent in terms of his conversation with you. Uh, it's very easy in this industry, you know, um, to, to sort of be, hey, cool, dude, how's it going? And he wasn't like that at all. He took it very seriously. Yeah. For a guy who worked on a show about zombies, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, you know, he he uh, he's a thinker and, and someone who, who brought that. I mean, I think he realized that after the second series where they talked and talked, and then talked a little bit more, and then continued to talk after they were done talking, uh, that he needed to up the horror aspect of this. But it, there, in order for the horror to work, and we've talked about this a hundred times on this show, in order for the horror to work, you have to uh, temper it with other things. You have to make sure that the audience cares about the characters. You have to make sure that, you know, uh, that, that there's a reason uh, for if someone dies, you have to care about that person in order to care about their death on the show. He made he was very clear about that, and he understood that. So he he married all these kind of elements and came up with a I thought a a, a, a season that was the best of the three so far. I know online some uh, of the comic book aficionados don't agree with me only because it it does differ from the comic books, but to them I would say. Comic books, television show, two different things. If you just wanted to follow the story of the comic book, read it again. Right. And let the television show be what it is. It's like movies and, and, and uh, uh, books. They're two inherently different forms, and sometimes things have to be changed in order for it to work in, in a different form. So... Uh, and, and he understood that. And, you know, he made, I think, a great season of television. Uh, I would have liked something more to happen with the governor on the last episode, but you know what? 
I'm still excited to wait until October to see what happens next. Oh, yeah. No, there's still a lot going on here. And we were surprised, uh, you know, when, when Frank Darabont left, you know, it would have been easy to have written the series off at that point. Yeah, but absolutely. So much yeah. has changed. And it'll be interesting. When it comes back in the fall, uh, one of the questions I have is how old will Judith be? Are we going to see a lot of time going by in between? You know, the, the, between season two and season three, there was almost a, six months to a year that had gone past between the storyline. So who knows? We, we, it, it may be a complete surprise when we get back is what we'll find. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know. I mean, because the one thing about this show is that, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be linear. and It doesn't necessarily have to uh, even come back and, and put us back in Woodbury or in the prison. We could start off in another little town, uh, two towns over, and maybe eventually worm our way back to Woodbury or the prison. So anything could happen here. Yeah, and, and there's great value in any kind of story that can keep you up late at night. I find that more than anything, really, are people are really compelled to want to talk about this series in a way that I don't often hear for dramatic content. There's always people that want to gather and gossip about what's happening with the Kardashians or The Bachelor or some reality TV you know, stuff which is manipulative by its nature. That's why people are, are wanting to talk about it. Here, it's very different. Everybody wants to talk about The Walking Dead, not just what has happened, but what could happen, what might happen, what's going on in their heads, what's keeping them up late at night. That is an astonishing achievement. Yeah, no it is. And, and, uh, and it was a good show, regardless of, of some of the, the, the stuff that happened online. I haven't read the books. I have no attachment to this story other than what I saw through my screen. You know, and, and, and I, you know, and honestly, I don't want to read the books. I'm not, you know, for some reason, this isn't one of those situations where I'm going to be pushed towards reading the books. I, I'm, I'm being told the story in a way that I'm perfectly happy and satisfied with. And, uh, I'm, going to, and I'm going to stay with that. Oh, that sounds great. Um, well, I have a cute little story that I want to share. Yes. And um, I, um, I'm fascinated by any kind of relationship between uh, animals and technology. Right. Something I'm always sort of reading about. And there's a little story that's been kicking around for a while um, that I didn't believe at first. I got little tiny details, and lately I got all the information. So here it is. Um, out in the Indian Ocean... Uh, around the Australian territory, there is a small little island called Christmas Island. Right. Sounds like a, something in a little children's yeah. book. Yeah. Now, although it's called Christmas Island, it's not a cold place. Mm -hmm. It's actually a tropical island. They've got palm trees and beaches and beautiful sand. The reason it's called Christmas Island is because it was discovered on Christmas Day. And, and isn't it in? Isn't Christmas Island in Mutiny on the Bounty? Does it come up in Mutiny on the Bounty? It might. I don't get up while you continue telling your story. So this island is special because it is inhabited by nocturnal creatures that like to steal gadgets. <laughs> Which I, you know, as soon as I heard that, I thought, is this real? I have to find out about this. Right. And it, to the point that if you visit the island, the locals will try to warn you that you need to hold on to your possessions. <laughs> and what happens is that occasionally you get this scenario that repeats itself, where that you get a uh, cocksure tourist that shows up that says, you know, I've traveled the world, I know everything, don't talk to me. So when they arrive, the locals will go, oh, excuse me, sir, about your belongings. Go, yeah, I know what I'm doing, leave me alone. Yeah. And they'll end up going for a hike in this beautiful island, um, and it's, it's large enough that you can go travel for a long distance, and you'll eventually reach a, a serene little point. Right. There's nobody around. It's just the beaches with little crabs on the beach. There's birds up in the trees, beautiful. And you think there's this beautiful picturesque view. And you think, I'm going to take a picture. And they'll put their bags down on the ground and start unfolding a tripod and get it all set up and look out in the ocean and think, it's warm. I better take off my jacket. And then they reach down to grab their camera, and the camera's gone. Right. And they look at it and like, you know, that moment where you're thinking, where could the camera be? But there's a part of your brain that says, no, the camera was there. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, know yeah. this. And you look around and there's no one there. I mean, it's just the same thing you just saw. It's the birds, it's the trees, it's the yeah. crabs on the beach. What, you know, there's no person around. You're looking maybe for some native that's all in camouflage, hiding somewhere, holding your camera, but they're not there. And so you check your bag and you check your coat. And there's a certain point while you're doing this, you get this weird feeling in the back of your head that you're being watched. Right. And when you look around, you realize that you've gathered an audience. And I'll show you what it looks like. Do, 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 do. There we are. 
of these guys, crabs. With and, with extra large legs, it looks like. These are the largest crabs on the planet. Really? And what you'll find is they will surround you, and their little eye stalks go up on their heads like that, and they just watch you. Right. They're kind of just checking you out, and of course you're going crazy, looking through your bags, and you suddenly become self-conscious. There's nothing sinister about it. In fact, it's almost as if you're entertaining to right. the crabs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You may ask them, you know, has anyone seen what happened to my camera? The crabs don't say anything. Well, the, reason the, crabs don't, the reason the crabs don't say anything is because they've got the camera. Yeah. These are called robber crabs. That's such of their wow. reputation that they are known for stealing just about anything that they can get their little claws on. Huh. A truly, truly remarkable creature on the planet. You would never suspect crabs. You might be looking for monkeys, ferrets, anything yeah. like that. No, these little tiny crabs that are called robber crabs. I'll throw up the image again so you can get a, a look at them. Do, 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 do. And like, how big are they? Very yeah. large. Yeah. So about the, the size of um, uh, like a dinner plate. They're quite large. They're the biggest crabs that are out there. I'll, I'll, I'll be throwing up some other photos that give you a little bit more of a perspective. But what's special about these crabs is, number one, because of their size and because they evolved on a remote, isolated island, they have no natural predators. Right. And so like all creatures, like on Madagascar, that means they have no fear. Right. So when you find them, you can pick them up, you can look at them, and they just wait for you to put them back down. Wow. Wow. Even though human beings tend to eat crabs, it doesn't enter their head. They're just yeah. the thought that someone might do harm to them just does not occur, so they are very friendly. That's or at least that's awesome. a perception. Wow. And, and because of their size, they're also highly intelligent. Right. Uh, and which means that they're very curious by nature. And so when you have a creature that is both very curious and not afraid of anything, it means it goes wherever its curiosity will take it. Right. They are, uh, for no one knows quite why, but they're extremely fascinated with human beings. Mm. They love us. Uh, if you do anything, you will attract an audience because they'll all come over and watch you. Right. If you're building something, you know, you drop a knapsack on the floor and they go, ooh, knapsack? Yeah. What's going and, on? Oh, yeah. Well, they'll come over and they'll rummage through your knapsack. They'll go through your bags and they look for little things that they can grab. They love cameras and then they will try to carry them off. And it's funny because they're very slow moving. They're like tortoises. Uh, they live to about 70 years old, so they're old, kind of slow moving, but highly intelligent. They'll take a camera and then they'll run off with it. And it, because you would never think of it, they usually get away before you even <laughs> can find them and go chase them down. Wow, that is, uh, I've never heard of this. I love that they have no fear. I love that we're being picked up. That's it. I love they're, it. They're, they're, they're so driven by their curiosity that um, people who live on the island have to always be conscientious to make sure that their front door and back door is closed. <laughs> Wow. They will wander into your home, and they're nocturnal, so they tend to show up at night, and they like to run off with forks, knives, and shoes. Love shoes. Yeah. Um, one of their favorite things is peanut butter sandwiches. If you, they have people go camping, and that's the first thing that goes disappears. It's like you have a little, you know, uh, like a carry-all, and there's some picnic yeah. baskets or something. Crabs will run off with the, the little peanut butter sandwiches. It is just amazing, just astonishing. I have the theory, heard yeah, now the theory as to why they're like this is partly because they're they're because they're the largest crabs in the world. Right. They have an unusual lifespan. They live to about seventy years. They start off in the ocean, they're born in the ocean, they're little tiny larval versions of themselves, and they just sort of float right. until they're they're large enough that they get washed up onto the beach. And then their youth and their teenage years are spent as hermit crabs. They run off and they find a shell, and that's their home. And then once they get large enough, they drop the shell, and so they just roam around on the island. And, you know, some people think that this is a case of them missing their shell. They still want stuff. Right. And so this is right. why they'll pick out cameras and shoes and, and other things and carry them off to their little burrows. But that's not where it ends. No. I'll show you this. This is astonishing. Okay, where are we here? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> get ready for this. They climb trees. Wow. They climb trees. I repeat, 
they yeah. climb trees. You will find them up in the trees. And what I mean by they climb trees, because I've seen some animals that will climb up the bark of a trunk of a tree and just hang. Aardvarks will do this apparently. They'll climb up and, and sort of do scent markings and stuff like that. No, 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 no. These guys, here's another image. Yep, there we are. They go out on the branches like squirrels. That's crazy. Wow. It is absolutely insane. And they're, they're beautiful. Look at the blue color there. Uh, well, they, some of them are blue. Some of them are, are deeply orange. I guess a lot of it has to do with what they eat initially. Uh, right. You know, it's the, 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 the food source dictates the coloring of the shell probably. Right. But what they're doing up in trees is they're getting fruit. Right. The crabs are smart enough to have figured out that what's hanging on the tree above that they can see with their little eye stalks is the same thing as what they found on the ground below. And so they will actually work to climb up that tree and then knock the fruit down to the ground. <laughs> and often what you will find apparently if you live on the island, you'll be walking along to work and you look over and there'll be one tree with about 20 crabs around the, the base of it and one crab up in the, the, the branches knocking fruit down with all the others. Wow. Yeah. They're called robber crabs. Um, I'd heard of them initially as coconut crabs, which is a name the internet came up with, because the first legend about them is that their claws are strong enough to break open coconuts, <laughs> which apparently is quite true, but not nearly as fascinating as yeah. their intelligence and their willingness to come into your home and w run off with like forks and knives and peanut butter sandwiches. That I just love. Yeah, they've got little sticky fingers. I love that. I love that. That is a great story. That, you know, The Walking Dead is gone till October, so we have to uh, come up with different things to talk about. That was an awesome little story. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. No, and uh, I have to thank Brian Cox, the astrophysicist, because yeah. he's the one who actually went to Christmas Island to shoot a television episode. Didn't know any of this. And so brought all this story back, and for the first time I had verification because he actually went out and shot. And what's great is that he's sit sitting there, and this is you'll, you'll understand this. When you're on camera, you're standing there, you're trying to tell a story. Yeah. And on the scene, <laughs> on camera left, is a crab that shows up and approaches him. And he can sit there and talk to the crab, and the crab's just doing this. It just is so fascinated by him that he'll come, he just starts attracting crabs to come and watch him do television. I, it's, just, it's amazing. Wow, that's very cool. Brian Cox, he's not only a friend of Brian uh, Mays from Queen, <laughs> but he's uh, also an entertaining TV guy. Well, uh, that's very cool. And I assume that we will have video on Um, I guess of Ravine. I, I don't have any video of the crabs themselves, to be honest. Okay, well, we'll... Uh, on YouTube. Yes. Well, we have, we'll, we'll throw up some uh, Ravine video there to have a look at, and you can listen to my Glenn Mazzara interview uh, there. And um, I don't know. What are we talking about next week? Do you have ideas already? I, I haven't yet. I'll have to do some research and just try to find some stuff. By all means, uh, if you want, you can send us ideas at hailyouzombies.com. Yeah. You can listen to uh, your interview with Mazzara and give your theories about what's going to happen when we come back in the fall on The Walking Dead. Will Judith be a toddler? Is this going to be the crawling dead, the toddling dead? Uh, <laughs> I would love for the opening of, of the new episode to be a um, like Stanley Kubrick crawling camera down on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the back tombs of the prison and when it turns back it's just Judith doing this and coming to like some feet and she looks up and there's a zombie going <laughs> Looks down on Judith, and as he reaches for Judith, suddenly, boom, arrow right in the forehead, and see Daryl walking off. You never get to see Daryl's face, just his hands pick up Judith, and as he's walking off, her face. Part of the poncho. Yeah, back at the camera, just giggling uh, away. That would be hilarious. So much that you can do. All right, people. Next week. Next week. Thank okay. you very much.